for some reason, unknown to many, Australia used to be fearful of attack by the Russians. With this in mind, the Victorian government went all out and solved the problem by ordering a revolutionary warship to supplement the shore-based fortifications of Port Phillip Bay. It was in 1866, and they felt the need to defend the colony. The mighty ship arrived at Port Phillip Bay in 1871, the flagship of what was to become the Royal Australian Navy. The day I went to see it was almost storm-like. It was blowing a gale and there was choppy water and spray everywhere. The yachties were loving it. The people in the little rubber boats were having a good time, as were the kids on surfboards and some photographer types in the cliff face who were obviously wanting that sort of windblown look. Half Moon Bay is in the suburb of Black Rock. It's sort of hidden under colourful cliffs. There's a drive down to the jetty area where you will find the Black Rock Yacht Club, the Half Moon Bay Surf Life Saving Club, the Cerberus Beach House Restaurant and Fish and Chip Shop, the Black Rock Boat Ramp and the Black Rock Wharf. There's also Half Moon Beach, which is an intimate little spot that normally provides calm swimming waters and a nice place for the grandparents to build sand castles. Just out from the wharf is a breakwater made from the remains of what was Australia's first armoured warship and the first ever designed to operate without sails the HMVS Cerberus. After never having left Port Phillip Bay, nor fired its guns in anger during its entire life, the Sandingham Council purchased it for 150 quid on the 26th of September 1926. They sunk the poor old thing at Half Moon Bay to serve as a breakwater for the yacht club. A sad ending for a ship that originally cost well over £117,000. The wreck now sits in approximately 3 metres of water, less than 200 metres from shore, to serve as a beachside dunny for seagulls. In Greek mythology, Cerberus is often referred to as the Hound of Hades, a multi-headed dog that guards the gates of the underworld to prevent the dead from leaving. This Cerberus was perhaps slightly more down to earth in that it was one of seven in a class of ships called a breastwork monitor oh. and the first in the world to have a central superstructure containing rotating turrets. Cerberus was 68.6 metres long, 13.7 metres wide and with a draft of 4.7 metres. It had a freeboard of 1.2 metres and what they called the breastwork extended 2.1 metres above the deck and was 34 metres long. Cerberus had a maximum speed of 9.75 knots with an economical cruising speed of about 6 knots. A binnacle is a waist-high case or stand generally mounted in front of the helmsman in which navigational instruments are placed for easy and quick reference. Armour-plated companions were hatchways on the upper deck that not only allowed daylight to shine through but also provided access via a ladder or stairway to the cabins below. The captain's observatory was the little personal hideaway where the captain could obviously answer his emails, check his Facebook and maybe watch a bit of porn. The ship had two rudder control stations, one for peaceful cruising where good visibility was the main requirement, the other positioned, tucked well away nicely behind armour plating for when there were times of action. The main armament was four 25 centimetre guns mounted in two turrets with almost uninterrupted arcs of fire. Each cannon had to be hand cranked into position and required a crew of 33 men to load, arm and fire the thing. Each gun weighed 18 tonnes, was muzzle-loaded and had to be withdrawn completely inside the turret to be reloaded. The cannons could fire a shell 
weighing 180 kg up to 3.7 kilometers and they could do it once every three minutes. Imagine the poor buggers doing the loading and the firing, deaf as a post, sweating like pigs and with no occupational health and safety at all in those days. The magazines were below deck and extremely well shielded, but imagine the cramped space, poor ventilation and having to lift shells weighing 180 kg. Cerberus had a standard ship's company of 12 officers and 84 sailors. In wartime, the ship took on an additional 40 men to complete the crew. The main cabins for the 12 officers were towards the stern, and the forecastle, as it was called, was towards the bow. This is where the crew were housed. The ship's twin screws, or propellers as a lot of people might call them, were driven by two horizontal twin-cylinder, double-acting, simple steam engines. They had a 110 centimetre bore, 69 centimetre stroke, and were provided by steam produced by five coal-fired boilers with 13 furnaces. The steam and engines generated 1,021 kilowatts and drove two propellers with a diameter of about 3.7 metres. The Cerberus was the first British warship to be solely steam powered. The ship had a bunkerage of 240 tonnes of coal, which would last just under five days at maximum speed and 10 days at economical speed. The general ventilating shaft was quite substantial, but given that it needed to feed the whole bottom section of the ship as well as the ship's engines. The ship had armoured plating ranging from 150 to 200 mil in thickness for the waterline armoured belt around her hull. This was backed by about 230 to 280 mil of teak. The citadel armour protecting the breastwork ranged in thickness from 200 to 230 mil, and the gun turrets had 250 mil faces and 230 mil sides. Cerberus was protected by an armoured deck that was also 25 to 32 mil in thickness. So you can understand why the damn thing was so heavy. For added protection, Cerberus could take water into ballast tanks, at that which decreased her already low freeboard until only the turrets and breastwork were visible. Now, all these specifications sound great, but the ship's flat bottom and shallow draft meant that it could roll up to about 40 degrees from the centre line in bad weather. And talk about making a person seasick, you didn't have to be a genius to realise that Cerberus was definitely not suited for ocean cruising. Poor seaworthiness combined with high running cost, limited application and ageing infrastructure meant that the days of the Cerberus were numbered. Over the whole of the ship's life, it never left Port Phillip Bay, and the only action it ever saw was once when five of its crewmen were killed by a mine during exercises where their small tender was blown up. Another occasion was when miners were trapped in a flooded gold mine in Creswick in Victoria, and divers from the Cerberus were sent to assist but on arrival discovered they had dive suits that didn't fit and air hoses that could only reach a fraction of the way into the mine. Possibly the biggest action the Cerberus ever saw was the day they sunk it to make the breakwater. After being unceremoniously scuttled, the Cerberus enjoyed a period whereby it was used by scuba divers and fishermen. The interior of the ship was also used as a training course for assault swimmers. Even Joe Public regularly used the decks for picnics. 
However, in 1993, there was a major structural collapse after rusting deck supports and stanchions gave way. These days, climbing on Cerberus or being in the water within 100 metres surrounding it is prohibited. And apart from the fine of $10,000, there's now an imminent danger of drowning due to the hull collapsing completely. Numerous organisations have been formed over the years with the view to restoring the ship, and some action has happened, but by and large the poor old thing remains rusting away as a stark reminder that Australia is not quite as active at protecting its history as some other countries. Why not uh, slide down and have a look at the old ship one day? Maybe take a chair and munch some fish and chips while you do it. You'll, you'll be pleased you went.